Hello and welcome to the Norwich Centre stage here at ITRON Utility Week. My name is Adam Malik and I'm joined now by Dr. Michael Lubweber who is the Deputy Director at the Energy Institute at the University of Texas in Austin. Dr. Weber, welcome. Thank Michael. you very much. We uh, spoke last year. You very eloquently laid out the curriculum that you're doing uh, and all the evolution of that. If we could uh, spend like just the first few minutes, if you could tell us a little bit more about how it's gone further, because I know you were going to be trialing a lot of things around online learning and just some of those experiences that would be quite useful to bring us up to speed. Sure. Uh, the, the broader mission is to educate people on energy and water, people being students in the classroom, but also the general public, experts, practitioners, you, you name it. So there's a range of things we try. Uh, there are books, there are speeches, op-eds, articles, one-on-one um, -on -one engagement, but there's also a documentary in process we'll talk about, as well as the online curriculum called Resourcefulness. The documentary and the Resourcefulness app or curriculum are based on a book I wrote called Thirst for Power, Energy, Water, and Human Survival. And that book is based on research that I did with my PhD students at the University of Texas. And so there's a lot of different pieces that go into this broader suite of materials, and we're trying to find new ways to reach more people. And so the, the online curriculum resourcefulness has now been downloaded by several thousand students. I can't remember the exact number. And we've been talking to schools. We're starting to adopt it either grade-wide or school-wide for use in their classroom because it's good for them to have access to high-quality materials that are free or affordable that they can use to follow up with students and their interests. So last year, we spoke a little bit about that. You also met some students from Energy Institute High School That's in right. Houston, yeah. Texas. Yeah. And they're some of the students and teachers we've been collaborating with, very engaged, really ahead of the curve, top of the class, great students. So they're the type of people we want tackling these problems. And they're also the type of people that companies are going to want to hire someday. So it's good to work with the students and the teachers, but also the, the general public. So tell us a little bit about this documentary that you're doing. I mean, was that always planned or did that come out of uh you know, was it just an idea and you said, let's go for it? The documentary was not always planned. It's sort of a relatively recent idea. We really conceived of it uh, together with ITRON last summer. And we'd been working on resourcefulness, the curriculum. We'd already had the book, we already had the speeches and other things. And because of another project I was working on that was documentary oriented, we realized that we could reach millions of people through TV. No surprise to anyone in the business. But for a professor who gives speeches to dozens and writes articles for hundreds, being able to reach millions through TV was pretty attractive in terms of scale of platform. And so we decided to partner with ITRON, and they're good, great partners for this, wanting to reach more people around making a documentary, capturing the themes from the book around the importance of energy and water, the interconnections of energy and water, the vulnerabilities of those interconnections, as well as some of the solutions. And between the documentary, the online course, the book, we hit different audiences with different levels of depth in the documentary. I think it's a lot of fun. It has more of a global view, very visual, an hour long, digestible for a general audience but also useful in the classroom and also for students on field trips, that kind of thing. Well, tell us a little bit about that global view, because um, you know, I was following you on Twitter and you were in France. What were some of the things that you were covering on the, uh, uh, when you were abroad and looking at it? The story of energy water in the end is a global story because these resources have global reach and global impact. In the United States, we tend to have a U.S. focus, makes a lot of sense, but the story extends beyond our boundaries, especially when you get to the history, and the history of it goes back thousands of years, and the reason why you might have thought Italy is because we were looking at Roman ruins, but we were looking at Roman ruins in the south of France. We went to the south of France to look at Pont de Gare, which is a famous aqueduct, a Roman aqueduct, built about 2,000 years ago. It was built over 20 years with 1,000 slaves working every day to move water about 55 miles from a source, a spring, to Nîmes, the Roman capital of the south of France at the time. And it was an indicator of just the effort the Romans went to around water. It was that important. It was a way to Romanize the territory. It was a way to secure political and economic power. It was a way to keep people happy. It was a way to improve quality of life. And it was a remarkable, really remarkable engineering feat. And we wanted to go see it. And so we went there and visited it, talked to some of the experts, interviewed them for the documentary. And it's remarkable because over this fall of 55, 56 miles or so, the water only drops a few feet. And so it's a very subtle grade, but a grade nevertheless, and so it's a gravity-fed system. Today we would use electric pumps or something else. We have modern energy available today, but they didn't in the Roman times. It, but it, it just sort of shows how innovations change, how water is important, what it means for all these different purposes. Global story, global history. When you look at that experience, you look, you look at what you're, uh, what you're doing, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and in the research of your book, what are some of the things that you feel where we might be going in the wrong direction, you know, because we take naturally some of the resources for granted. We turn on a tap, water comes out, turn on, the, flick the switch, electricity goes on. 
do you think that we need to redouble our efforts to educate people that we should not take this for granted and we are actually in a fragile place? Yeah, I, I think the sense of vulnerability or fragility is something I feel very urgently, very importantly, and I don't think it's shared nationwide or, or worldwide and should be. It's, feel, it's really felt by some people very acutely because they have water scarcity today or energy scarcity. But in the United States or Europe, sometimes we take it for granted because it's been so easy, so reliable, so accessible, so affordable for so long. So it's a challenge, uh, especially think for the billion people who don't have access to electricity today or access to water or wastewater. So it's a real problem for some people in the world and we have solutions that maybe we can bring to bear on this problem. So I'd like to raise awareness on this. I, I think the biggest is that we're not mindful enough. And if we're not, if we're not mindful enough, then we might be wasteful. And if we're wasteful, we exacerbate the problem. So I'd like us to be more mindful. And if we're going to be more mindful, there are two elements I want to have in mind. One is global perspective. The other is long-term perspective. I feel like we are too local and too short-term with our thinking, and that's where you lead to a lot of these problems. And when you look at that, and you also look at the uh, individuals uh, uh, I interview who are iTron's customers, the utilities, you know, they're starting to talk a little bit more about being uh, more sustainable uh, uh, and so on. What role do you think the utility industry has in terms of really making this work? Or do we need to make them aware that it's good business sense to make it work? Well, yes to all of that. I think we absolutely need utilities to be a critical partner for this. They are a critical partner. Most of them realize that and recognize that. I think the biggest thing we need within the utility word, world is a change in mindset. For the last 100 years, for good reason, utilities have focused on access and reliability. And the reason they focus on access and reliability is because we didn't have universal access 100 years ago, and we've been building towards that. And in places like the United States, we now have just about 100% access. That's key, along with access, has to be reliable and affordable. Those have been the priorities for utilities for very intentional purpose for a long time. But now that we have universal access and really good reliability and affordability, we can start to add in these other values like sustainability or uh, security, other things that might maybe we didn't really care about or might not have been our top priorities 40 years ago. So as utilities go through that transition, they're looking for other ways to improve the system that's on their minds. We need regulators to be on board with that which means allow them to spend the money they need on this kind of innovation. We need customers to be on board with that, which means we're all part of the stakeholder. We're turning off the tap and not waste water. So we need more partnership, more collaboration, shifts in mindset. Most utilities are aware of this and ready to go, um, but everyone else around them might or might not be on board. So we have work to do everywhere, and in the end we have to be integrated and collaborative to get it done. And uh, just final question is, okay, where do you think the real impetus is going to come from? Is this going to be like other industries where uh, the customer, the end customer, is the one who's going to galvanize change. I, I think real change will come from a variety of places, and I guess all good movements don't start with one person. They start with many different directions. There are a lot of customers who will demand this for philosophical reasons. They just want a greener, more sustainable system. There will be some customers who demand it because they think it's a more resilient or reliable system. There's some people who think it'll be cheaper in the long run, so they'll have different motivations, economic motivations. I think most utilities really do believe in the long-term success of their systems, and they see the long-term challenges shifting. So I think we'll arrive at the right answers if everyone moves there, even if the originating motivation might be different. Uh, but I think along the way, we need a lot of education to raise awareness about the opportunity. For the United States in particular, I think most people just really care about the pocketbook. I think that's a vast preponderance of consumers, is they don't feel like they have a lot of excess money, and so anything that feels more expensive now will get resistance. And one of the hard parts to articulate to people is actually, this will save money in the long run. It might cost money to do something now, but it costs more to do nothing. That's a hard thing to understand, that if I do nothing, the system becomes more broken or more expensive. And also, if we add in all the other costs, the public health costs, the ecosystem costs, reliability costs, we need to take this holistic view. So I think it takes a lot of education to get there. It also takes a lot of innovation. And I think what we'll find as a technical, technical optimist is that the technical solution will be cleaner, more efficient, more robust, more reliable. It'll serve all these purposes, but it'll take some longer term thinking to get there because a lot of times it costs more upfront, but then are cheaper along the way. 
So it's a multi-parameter problem. It's going to take a lot of stakeholders to get it done. Well, that's, a, that's a bit of a global problem, right? Long Absolutely. Long-term thinking. We're, we're losing that heart. I, I think we are. And I think the United States in particular, we're driven by a two-year election cycle and a quarterly financial reporting cycle. We have a short-termism built into our decision-making, and that's a challenge. Um, and especially if we're dealing with a water problem, which might be a 100-year problem, energy infrastructure is a 40 to 100-year problem. So we're dealing with multi-decade or multi-century decisions on a three-month to 24-month decision timeline. That's hard. There's a fundamental mismatch in the stake of the problem in the window within which we have to make a decision. That's hard to solve. And on that note, I think we'll leave it because I, I don't think we're going to solve it here. But you're on the road to uh, doing the right things. And uh, you know, I encourage people to watch the documentary and uh, look up what Dr. Weber is doing online and, and your students as well. Because uh, you know, the- uh, It's their work, yeah. The, they're the, the ones the who are the smart ones. I interviewed uh, last year. I still remember that. It was a great interview. Thank you again for watching here at ITRON Utility Week Knowledge Center 2018.